guess I was around five or six years old, and we were driving to my grandparents' house, just my dad and I. All of a sudden, people would start honking at him and waving and leaning out of their cars and yelling his name, hi, Spike. And he'd wave back, and he'd say, hi, how are you? Nice to see you, as though he knew them quite well. And finally, I said to him, Daddy, who are all these people? And he said to me, how do I know? I've never seen them before in my life. People, even to this day, will come up and say, uh, Spike drank all Is that what he died from drinking? Uh, you know, I said, geez, he didn't drink, drink for 15 years before he died. He stopped probably the second or third big year of his career. In the beginning, I think he had to, to get through. He had so many things on him. He became such a fast success. He took a nurse along and giving him shots every hour, and he quit just like that, and he never drank again. But when Spike stopped drinking instantly, the whole band became a different band. Uh, everybody stopped drinking because he stopped drinking. Clink, clink, no more to drink. I had a cellar full, but now it's gone. Clink, clink, the glasses clink. Like the anvil chorus and my head is splitty, freaky, busty. Oh, brother, oh, ow, what do I do now? Pink elephants are running after me. Oh, that stuff was smooth as silk. From now on, I'll stick to milk. Nothing else to drink for me. Any of the bits that he ever created or ever did, uh, you could bring your family or children. Everything had to be clean and up above board. He never did anything like they do now. <laughs> Well, Spike uh, always wanted to give you a thrill a second. A thrill a minute wasn't enough for him. And as soon as he got out where people could see him, he realized that the, the records were so colorful, people wanted to see something that heightened the experience of just hearing the records. He basically knew that he could take it one step further than the audience or anybody ever intended it to go. And he decided that one day he wanted to have a review, a two and a half hour show and do it do one night is throughout the United States. And he was one of the first ones, I believe, that started concerts, so to speak. He would come up with the Spike Jones musical depreciation which review, go into theaters, go into large auditoriums, get involved in a whole very circusy type of situation, and came up with Spike Jones, the craziest show on earth. He added acts like uh, jugglers and girl dancers, girl singers, and uh, Comedians always had a midget with us. The first one was Frankie Little from Milwaukee. It really became kind of a traveling circus. It really had enough props for a, for a three-ring circus. We worked every night. Every place we went, we, uh, we were sold out. The stage shows were um, an extravagantis, a real spectacle. They were innovative, 
and very, very exciting, very, very colorful. It was fast, it was furious, and it was fabulous. Uh, so many things went on, uh, and, and the audience was just, you know, amazed. It was actually all planned. It was all written musically. He had an unbelievably sharp mind, a great ability to organize. He traveled with a private train where all the other bands had to get up every morning, catch a bus, and, uh, and, uh, and get lose sleep all the time. And when we'd get off the train in all these small towns, you'd wonder where the people were coming from. There were tiny towns. And in the evening, oh, they came out of the woodwork. I mean, thousands of people. And everybody followed that pattern from them on after Spike shows. He set the whole pattern of doing one-nighters and touring with, with a big show. That's where the boys taught me how to play poker. That's how I learned to play gin rummy. I learned all, all the bad things. And we had a giant. We had to tear two booths out, berths out, because he, he didn't fit in one. He was eight foot something, and they had to tear out in between, so he slept in two. And Billy Barty slept in what was left. And Spike was happy and content to be in his area, writing to disc jockeys throughout the country, uh, doing PR work, writing new, new material. His mind was always going, it's always going. He loved working. He loved creating. We would have these brainstorming sessions where Spike would invite various members of the group in to come, and we'd just throw out ideas. He'd come up with an idea for a number, and he would always say, give me five good gags, and we can do any number. If it was unnatural, and if it was not exactly easy to understand, that didn't inhibit him. He was uh, open to any, and in fact, the more uh, avant-garde in that sense, the more he'd go for it. It became a a group effort, and for me, it was a labor of love. He could take uh, the suggestions uh, from all the writers of different uh, things, and he knew what was good and bad, and when he finished organizing it, uh, it came out as a, as a hit. And that's how you come up with new ideas and keep the show living for as many years as he did. These were the best men in the industry, and he paid them top money. Spike was very proud of the musicianship of his group, and he had every right to be. Well, you had to be a great saxophone player who could play classical music and be a showman, too, and everyone in the band was there. The guys just played uh, fantastic charts, and they played it all so well, and besides doing comedy. He chose the men for their talent, and I think their, their personality and how they get along with each other. Basically, it was a very happy, well-unified, uh, very creative, uh, warm group that we had, and it really became family. It's quarter to three. There's no one in the place except you and me so set him up joe i got a little story you ought to know spike was really very much of a loner when i met him i had very little contact with him at the beginning of of our relationship um and i thought he was very stern and one day, out of a clear blue sky, he said, would you like to have dinner after the show tonight? And I said, what? And he said, yes, would you like to have dinner? I said, sure, I'd love it. So he took me out, and we had dinner, and we enjoyed each other very much that evening. And uh, then I didn't have dinner with him again for maybe 10 days, and then he asked me out again. And from that time on, we started seeing each other as we worked, and together a little more, and that's how it started. A divorce. Um, I don't, it's always difficult on everybody, but um, I think it was most difficult for me because my parents had a very hard time coping with telling me that they were going to get a divorce. My mother um, took me to the bank as she changed her name from Mrs. Spike Jones to Mrs. Patricia Jones on certain documents and accounts, and that was to explain it to me. Um, and my father just simply explained to me one day that we uh, couldn't live under the same roof. And that was it. Being one of 11 children and Spike being an only child, he loved my family around him. And whenever uh, we worked in town, I mean, all 11 brothers and sisters and all the nieces and nephews, they would all come en masse to see Spike Joe, and he loved it. That's why I think he was so happy with Helen Greco, because she came from such a big family. And they were hugging and kissing family. Uh, and. Uh, uh, he, it really, he, he loved that, all of that family around, because he had never had any family, really. Just before the record ban in the winter of 1947, 
we were recording everything we could get a hold of, and there was a tune laying on a piano called All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth. Spike handed it to me and said, George, see if you can do something with this. All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. My two front teeth. See my two front teeth. See if I could only have my two front teeth. Then I could wish you Merry Christmas. And it uh, did reasonably well. I think it sold about three million or something by now. We weren't being corny. We were doing. We were playing fine music and really performing. And we became known as just versatile performers and excellent musicians. Later, we had to start putting comics in, uh, like uh, uh, Sir Frederick Gass, who was not a musician, and Doodles Weaver was not, because we couldn't. You couldn't find guys like, uh, you know, those uh, the early guys. And there they go. Hang over a second on the length by the rail and a fetal bomb. <laughs> and I'm telling you around the turn they go. And now it's number two and 47. And here, here's Esther Williams. <laughs> and her husband, Ben Gay. <laughs> on the straightaway is Guy Lombardo. <laughs> Lady driver parks her car. Here's Cadet Happy to the moon, straight to the moon. Captain Jet, Cadet Happy to the moon. <laughs> and Senator McCarthy is late to work. Here's a band you recognize, Sammy Kay. <laughs> the crowd is going mad. They're coming down on the wire. What a race, what a photo finish. And there goes the winner! <laughs> Beetle Bob. Spike Jones' popularity really uh, hit a crescendo throughout the 1940s, peaking probably his best years were 1945 to 49. He had the network radio show and had one hit record after another. The challenge came when we came to doing television. People would say, you guys are natural, you should be in TV and so forth. And uh, he was terrified of trying it. He was waiting for the right moment. He got a big fat one. In those days, was a big contract. We are going to do an hour, Colgate Comedy Hour. And it was live. You got what you saw, you saw what you got. There was, wasn't any tape. You couldn't take it over. And uh, you didn't get a second chance. If a joke bombed, it bombed. And you stood there with eight on your face. Everybody was very uptight. There was lots of things that did and could go wrong. stage you, you weren't fighting time like you were in TV TV you had X amount of time to do a specific job if something goes wrong that's it yeah. like in the, the Colgate comedy hour in New York when the uh, the master electrician had a heart attack and fell over the switches they couldn't move him and uh, the, it was a revolving stage it was supposed to turn and all that all this was going live no way you could stop and it was really something a tragic thing you remember that? Yeah, and, and it was on the beat, too, right on yeah, the beat. Yeah, it was, 
You're really something. And they were singing, we were doing the Foreign Legion number where we were singing, goodbye forever, <laughs> goodbye forever. And here's a man, and they're crying back there, and it's all going on, you couldn't stop. Gentlemen, join me in a song of victory for this brave legionnaire. appreciation show we did the same thing every night for months months but when we went into the series on a weekly series now we had to come up with new ideas every week it was like an opening night every night take my hand i'm a stranger <laughs> loved writing for television and uh, all the boys loved being in television I think he enjoyed that more than any part of uh, the performing end of his career <laughs> One of the earliest remembrances of my dad was when I was very, very young, three years old. Um, he dressed me up in a suit that was totally identical to his. When he was playing in Las Vegas at the Flamingo Hotel, the offstage announcer would say, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Spike Jones." And I would walk out on stage, this little three-year-old person, and I would walk to the center microphone and look around, and I, I would stare out at 600 people. And then my nanny would be at the opposite end of the wing to come back and take me off by my ear, and the show would start. This is our son, Spike Jr. Oh, oh. What an improvement, what an improvement. <laughs> he died when I was six years old, so I really don't have any personal memories of him. When he was home, uh, it was always something that involved his career. When I was younger, we really didn't see them that much. We never went to a park or to a zoo. Looking back on it, I think I would have preferred if they had probably stayed home more. It was a lot like being with Ringling Brothers, Barnum & Bailey Circus. How do you like Daddy's band, Spike? <laughs> 
Frank, I guess it isn't my day. Go pick up his check, honey, Fine. all right? <laughs> we didn't go to the zoo because we had one. It was a terrific situation to grow up in. You know, this being on television, it's making me a very important man with my children. In fact, I'd like to show you what happened after last week's program when I went home to see little Spike. Do you want to go with me? <laughs> So what did you think of the show? How did you like the show? <laughs> For my brother being Spike Jones Jr., I think it was more difficult because right away he was known as the child of my dad. Helen and Spike Jones and their children, Linda, Spike Jr., Leslie, and Gina Maria, live in this comfortable colonial-style house in Beverly Hills, California. Hi, honey. Hi, darling. Hello, Helen. Hi, Charles. Helen, does Spike ring gongs and honk horns and fire guns around the house? Well, no, really. He's terribly conservative. In fact, uh, so much so that I worry about him sometimes. Really. When I hear about how stern he was and how strict he was, I'm glad that I don't have some of those memories <laughs> that, that they'll talk about. Um, from what I understand, Mom used to cover up for us when we were bad. What a lovely family, Helen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mike, I understand why you like to work at home so you can be with them. That's right, Charles. That's why I have my office here, so I can spend more time with the kids. His career wasn't as prominent as it had been, and I think it was, well, he felt it, it was always because of the music change. <laughs> classic line was uh, the songs that were out today were funnier than he could ever make them. always try and stay as topical as possible because he felt that's where the humor worked. If you understood where the music was and if you understood that, then you'd understand the joke. And for the first time on television, we showed the bottom half of Elvis. <laughs> Rock and roll, he had a, a little bit of difficulty with. Let's say he had a lot of bit of difficulty with. He didn't understand things like Splish Splash and Papa Uma Mau because he thought those things were hysterical already. He says, how do you satirize this kind of stuff? His later albums uh, dealt with the whole image of stereo sound effects going back and forth from speakers and things like that. So I would probably, I would imagine from his point of view, opened up a whole new arena of sound for him. As life went on into the 60s, uh, he, he kept envisioning even more ambitious projects, some of which uh, never did get realized. But uh, 
Spike was a driven man, and he was never content with just something that uh, he had done before. He always wanted to do something else, something a little bit extra. He found out that he didn't have the physical strength and to really do as much as he used to. I think it was um, probably hard for him after having toured for so long to find himself home and trying to keep himself um, occupied. My dad was a, a massive smoker. He would uh, smoke uh, possibly three and a half packs a day. But during the, that time, uh, he also developed emphysema. He just kept smoking and smoking, the emphysema hit. Doctors didn't know anything about it in those days. And uh, I saw him smoke a lot, and I uh, just he drank a lot of black coffee, too, when I, I watched him. And uh, joyful, fun, smoked cigarettes, tremendous fun doing rehearsals, a lot of laughs, and uh, it just was bad. I'm just sorry to see that. We all were sad to see that, but we didn't know. He was working a hotel in Las Vegas. And my wife and I went backstage to see him. And Spike was godfather to our son. And uh, I, I felt so terrible seeing Spike in that condition. He was just, and no other word except terrible. He just looked like death warmed over, just parchment drawn over bones. I cried, he cried, my wife cried. And uh, in so much as he had been godfather of our son, he, Spike asked that we come back and bring my boy to see him again. And I promised I would. And Help me, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't face him again. It was just uh, too much for me to see him in that condition. He um, handled his illness, I think, with as much humor as he possibly could. He um, was very valiant, uh, very brave. He didn't whimper, he didn't complain. My mother, you know, was, was probably trying to shield us and, and didn't, you know, we didn't sort of sit down and say, okay, your dad's real sick and he's not gonna live too much longer. I was working up in Stockton and he called me again and he says we're gonna get this album. I didn't know he was as sick as he was. He said we're gonna do this album if it's the last thing we do. Well, we'd, well we didn't do it. It was the last thing he did but we didn't finish it. We did three sides uh, of it and and he uh, I was I was up there and he died and, and I, I couldn't believe it. I, I never thought he you know he was in, I thought he was indestructible. But I will always remember that um Helen said to me that morning when I was with her and my brother and sisters, um, I want you to go and be with your mother because she was a very big part of your father's life also, which I thought was very gracious of her to say. But you know, you're not, we're not sad anymore thinking about Spike. We think about all the cute things he did. And uh, he was a good friend. I know he was a, a lovely part of our lives, my wife and my children and his wife. And, he was a genius, and he knew what he wanted, and he did it. Personally, to me, Spike was probably one of the greatest people I ever knew. The people that worked for him had such great love and respect for him because he was a great talent and very creative. I think he was far before his time. I, I didn't realize at the time how lucky I was, and uh, I do now. It was a wild time with him. All the years I had with him, I wish I could do it again with him. It was fun. He was one of the greats, that's all I can say. So, we all miss him. Just people like Spike can never be replaced. And I was very proud to be Mrs. Spike Jones. And wherever he is up there, no doubt he's up there playing cards with my mother, who always loved to play cards. And if I know my mother, she lost a lot of money to him. God bless him. I miss him. Rocky and Bullwinkle, the 1950s TV cartoon series, wasn't just for kids. The dialogue between its two mainstays, Bullwinkle Moose and Rocket J. Squirrel, sparkled with some of the sharpest satire around. Friday at 9.25 here on 6, see some of their finest moments on Of Mice and Men, Rocky and Bullwinkle. That... Remember, for in-depth, comprehensive coverage of all the news, TV6 brings you weeknights, the nightly business report at 5.30, followed at 6 by the McNeil Air News Hour. Find out what's really going on here on TV6. <laughs> Thank you.
Ha 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 